Welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast, presented by Orion Advisor Solutions and hosted by Dr. Daniel Crosby, Orion's Chief Behavioral Officer and New York Times bestselling author. Each week, Dr. Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest on a range of compelling topics, from literature to psychology to financial wellness. To learn more about Dr. Crosby's behavioral finance work at Orion, visit www.orion.com. Hello and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby, and I'm joined today by Anthony Damsis, Deputy Head of Behavioral Finance at TD Wealth. He just completed some fascinating research on wealth confidence that caught my eye. And uh, in my effort to keep you, dear listeners, up to date on the latest and greatest thinking in behavioral science, uh, he has been kind enough to join me today from Toronto. Welcome to the show. Hi, Daniel. Good to be here. So we started to talk about how great Toronto is before the show, you know, before I hit record and I said, wait, I want the people to know that that one of the greatest meals I've ever had uh, was was in Toronto and it was at a Filipino place called Tinuno. You've not been, but you said it's close to your house. So I got to explain this to folks. Tinuno is a Kamayan and Kamay is the Tagalog word, the Filipino word for hand. And so the way that it works is you go to a table sort of family style. They cover the table in banana leaves. They pile mountains of rice in the middle. And then on top of the rice, you got fish, you got barbecue, you got chicken, you got spring rolls, you got everything, fruit, everything you could ever want. And you eat it all with your family or your friends with your hands. And it is that there's no utensils. And it's the greatest dinner you'll ever have. So this is my shout out to Toronto and and my welcome to you. Yeah, Toronto's a great city for food. Uh, it's so multicultural. You can pretty much find any subculture or you know, regional delicacy that you can imagine. Uh, so I'm not surprised you found a pretty awesome Filipino place. And you know, just to plug Toronto a little bit more, we just got our first uh, Michelin guide restaurants and ratings uh, this past year. So it's been a really awesome time for the Toronto food scene and also very hard to find a reservation anywhere. That's been that's been the new challenge. So the Michelin guide folks are in Atlanta right now and they're oh. going through and I cannot I cannot wait, you know, I cannot wait. So I can I can see why that would be a big deal for Toronto, a gorgeous city. I went on an architectural tour of Toronto last time I was there. And my favorite takeaway from that tour is that Toronto has represented New York City in film more than New York City has represented itself. Because I think, really? yeah, that's what they said, because of favorable, I think, favorable tax, you know, oh. favorable, <laughs> favorable tax structures. It's cheaper to film in Toronto and pretend like it's Manhattan than to yeah. film in Manhattan. The lower currency helps, I think, too. Yeah, yeah, the exchange rate may may help. So, but we're not here to talk about Filipino food <laughs> or, or film rights. We're here to talk about your fantastic new paper that just came out, and it's all about wealth confidence. And I want to talk about a point you made in in an, a, a sort of a write up of the paper, a summary of the paper, and you talk about how disconnected we are from the global reality of wealth and. You write in this paper that it takes a net worth of you know just under eleven thousand dollars. I assume that's Canadian uh, to is, be yeah. to to be richer than than half of the world's population. So like three and a half billion people, and yet the richest one percent of people in the world don't describe themselves as wealthy. You cite research from Ameriprise saying that only thirteen percent of American millionaires would describe themselves as wealthy. So talk to me about this disconnect and and why we don't sort of recognize our abundance for what it is. Well, it's all relative at the end of the day. Um, and so this idea of social comparisons and the people that we surround ourselves with as the benchmark for what it means to feel wealthy is absolutely critical. And one of the elements of what defines wealth confidence in our paper you know, but it, there, there's even more staggering research to suggest that there's this big gap between our objective reality and our subjective reality. And so what we see is that, like you said, only uh, you know, one in 10 millionaires consider themselves wealthy. But there was a, a, another study that was done uh, looking at 
how much people thought it would take to feel rich. And the average answer was around 2.2 million US dollars. Now of, you know, that's, that's a pretty different reality. And that's, that's put, that's even a higher echelon of global wealth. But then the study went a little bit further and asked of the people that do feel wealthy, what's your net worth? Well, it's only, only I put in, in air quotes, $560,000. So there's, it's, it's true on both sides of the spectrum. If you look at the global perspective, yes, everyone is, is quite wealthy and doing well. However, when you look at a relative scale, $500,000 is not necessarily the upper echelon of American society. So wealth confidence and subjective reality of how wealthy you feel is, can be, you can be above or below that. And, and the implications of that to your portfolio are, are pretty clear. I think self-evident. Yeah. Does our industry have a, a nomenclature problem? You know, you work for TD wealth. I work in wealth management and yet many of our target clients don't, don't perceive themselves as being wealthy. Have we sort of misaligned or misbranded ourselves when this is the reality on the ground? Well, I think there's a really big difference between wealth management and asset management. And, you know, for all it's good, growing our, growing the value of our portfolio is, is going to make us feel wealthier. I mean, there's no getting around that. We're not throwing out uh, all of economic theory here, but I think that there are other elements of, of our industry in wealth management that don't necessarily account for making us feel wealthier. And I think that our industry should be looking at a more comprehensive approach to measuring how wealthy our clients feel beyond just what, you know, an asset manager might, which is the value of your portfolio at the end of the day. It's, it's a broader scope of services that we can provide. And that's one of the major reasons why we undertook this study is how do the other elements and products and services that our advisors can provide contribute to our clients feeling wealthier? Yeah, it's a great it's a great point. I know it's something you've worked on at TD. It's something we're we're working on at, at Orion. Is is like how do you measure this true wealth? Like how do you capture it? How do you um, you know help people achieve that? You know, I I feel like I'm I'm reading your paper right, and I'm reading these comments, and I'm nodding my head and saying yes. Like we're so we're so wealthy, we're so blessed, we're so lucky. But then a sort of another voice, like you know, the the devil on the the other shoulder, says to me, "Well, but look, I mean, I know something about Toronto real estate prices. You know, a- absolutely astronomical." Like even even down here in Atlanta, you know, one of the sort of on paper more affordable big cities in the U.S. If I drove to, you know, if I drove you to a nice neighborhood in Atlanta, and you had a million dollar budget, that would be a relatively modest home. You know, I mean, that would be sort of a small two bedroom, three bedroom bungalow from the '40s. You know, in in New York, the average one bedroom, you know, it's it's a million dollars for a studio apartment in Manhattan. And you know, I've got three kids. I you know did the math with my planner the other day. It'll take me eight hundred thousand dollars to send three kids to a modest public state school. And so, you know, on on the one hand, it it feels like we're disconnected from you know from from how wealthy and how privileged we truly are, but on the other hand, it it feels like it's never been more expensive to live what feels like a relatively modest middle class life. You know, if you live in a large city, you have a couple kids, you want to send them to to college. That's a multi million dollar proposition. How how do you sort of square that? And is there a degree to which our perception that a million dollars isn't a lot is is right on? Yeah. So, not to sound uh, too distant here, but it, it's it's all relative. Um, and so the thing is, we tend not to compare ourselves to those who have less than us. We we tend to have eyes up. That's one way to put it. And we we look at the people around us to gauge how wealthy we are, right? And so what this means is that <clears throat> the wealth of those around on the other side of the world is really irrelevant to 
how we perceive our own levels of wealth. In cities, you know, Paul Krugman has uh, written a lot about this and how economies of scale has brought us, uh, brought high tech jobs, more money, you know, in our, in our general preference for a more diverse set of goods and services. But at the end of the day, we're not trying to take anything away from that, from the, from that feeling that maybe a million dollars doesn't stretch as far as it once did. You know, and we can thank inflation for that. But a million dollars is still a, an amazing level of wealth, right? And so I think it was uh, Roosevelt that said comparison is the thief of joy. And so if we start to look at our, at our neighbors, the Joneses next door, and, and say, well, they have more, or they live in a bigger house, or they have a more expensive car, that does a lot a detriment to our own perceptions of our station uh, in life. Now, in the Toronto real estate market, I could go on and, you know, housing is, is incredibly expensive. And so, I mean, I could, I could get totally sidetracked there, but you know, I, I don't really have a, a clean answer on, on, well, a million dollars isn't, doesn't make us rich. I mean, I, I don't know if I, if I necessarily agree with that. I think it's, it just depends on, it depends on who you're comparing yourself to and where you live and what your priorities are. Like, I think it's so much more complicated than just pointing to a number and saying, well, that's the number I, I need, or that's the number that, um, will make me feel a certain way. And that's not to take away from the cost of, of, you know, sending your kids to school or anything. It's, and that's unfortunately a, a reality, but it's quite tricky. I think at the end of the day of, of what it, what it actually means to feel wealthy. Yeah. When, you know, we'll get into that. Your, your study found these sort of three determinants of, of wealth confidence that, that I'm dying to get to and, and trying to hold off on, on spoiling anything there before I get to that question. But, you know, we've seen this, it, it's sort of like uh, famously engagement bait on Twitter you know, there's there's all these articles on Reddit and things about, you know, couples in Manhattan who make half a million dollars a year and how that's really not that much money. And, you know, they'll they'll sort of break down their budget and they're like, well, yes, by the time you pay for, you know, the live in nanny and two trips to Aspen, you really don't have much left over. And, you know, it's like, ah, like, you know, people are so, you know, people just love to, to pile onto this. But I think, you know, to a greater lesser extent we've all got some version of that, right? Like we've got, we've all got these things that, that feel essential to us that may be privileges that we haven't talked about, or, you know, may, may be, uh, feel very remote or very extravagant to someone else. You know, I mean, I've got three kids, like that's, that's an extravagance, I think in, in, in many respects, you know, I'm hoping to, to pay for their education and their grad school. Like that's, you know, that's, that's not an expectation that everyone has. And so even what, you know, what seems modest to me may seem extravagant to someone else and, and vice versa. And I think the reason your work is so important is it helps us step back and be more thoughtful about the lenses through which we, we view our wealth and, and our assumptions. I, I want to set up the study itself a little bit. Uh, you and your colleagues talked to 2000 Canadians to, to gauge their perceptions of their own wealth. And one of the things that I thought was cool about this, when you talk about the rationale for doing this study, you talked about some of the reasons why you wanted this information around wealth confidence is because it could impact the way they view their portfolios, right? Uh, that that under certain, certain assumptions of, of high or low wealth confidence, people could be too conservative or too risk-seeking. Can you can you talk about wealth confidence and how it impacts uh, that that sort of mindset piece? Yeah. So let me give you some more details about the study. So we, like you said, we studied uh, two thousand affluent Canadians, and what that means is that to participate in the study, they had to have at least a hundred thousand dollars in investable assets. And we asked if they had an advisor or if they were do-it-yourself investors, and, and we, but we primarily looked at advised clients. Um, or not clients, but advised uh, Canadians uh, around the world. And we asked them questions that covered the three 
elements of how we defined wealth confidence. And those three elements are your ability to you know, how how much purpose and and happiness you feel in your everyday life. Um, and so that gets to the idea of you know, who we are as individuals and how happy we feel in one aspect of our life tends to bleed over into how happy and purposeful we feel in other aspects of our life. Right? We're not these t- two desperate um, spaces in our minds. It all bleeds together at the end of the day. And the one I also mentioned a little bit before was this idea of social comparison. So the feeling of wealth compared to people you, know, you consider friends or your parents is a, is a really important factor. And the last element of wealth confidence is how we defined it is what we called outlook sentiment. And this captures the idea of feeling like you're on the right path to achieving your financial goals in the future. So another way to put that is if I think I'm going to feel wealthier tomorrow, it's going to affect how I feel about my wealth today. There's this, this temporal aspect that I, that I think is really important. And so after we defined wealth confidence, we asked a battery of questions to uh, you know, our, our uh, participants, including personality traits uh, and, and levels of their wealth, where their income comes from, and, and all these, you know, well, a diverse, wide-ranging set of questions to get at the core of what it means to feel wealthy in an advised context. And so, you know, when it comes to risk, what we see is that our personality plays a massive uh, factor in risk. Now, that wasn't necessarily the focus of this study, um, but our personality and our perceptions of how wealthy we feel will naturally have elements of, or will naturally shape the way we we perceive risk. And the thing is, it can go on both sides of the spectrum. So if you are objectively wealthy, for example, and you have a very high risk capacity, but you don't feel wealthy, that might lead you to take less risk in your portfolio. So, you know, another way to say that is that the portfolio that's been constructed may be under risked from a capacity perspective, but appropriately risked for your perception of your wealth, right? And and your tolerance and and, uh, perhaps composure is another way to put that. But on the other side of the spectrum, if you, if you are objectively less wealthy, and don't feel uh, very wealthy, you may have a strong hunger for risk because you want to catch up to those around you in a social comparison setting. And so that may lead you to take on unnecessary risk in your portfolio um, because you you have maybe a, a very high risk tolerance, but a lower risk capacity. Now, of course, there are regulations in Canada that, that dictate how an advisor can shape or how much risk they can recommend. But, you know, I think about clients or individuals who do it themselves, who may be misaligning or, or taking on too much risk in their portfolio because they think they they should be. And so you know, that's where the role of an advisor can really play to that to that individual's benefit because they can help understand where that individual is on a risk capacity or risk tolerance level, but then also understand, well, if I, if I don't feel wealthy or I do feel wealthy, that shapes how the advisor communicates the message around risk and can explain why that individual may be misaligned to psychologically to what the risk questionnaires are, are spitting out. Yeah, I guess, I guess that's, you know, you started to answer it there, but I guess that's my follow-up question. When there's a disconnect between capacity and composure, right? So mm-hmm. when there when there's this disconnect, do you accommodate the personality preference or do you sort of accommodate the facts on the ground or do you just have a conversation and, and try and meet in the middle? That's just one of those thorny problems to me, you know? Totally. Um, I The right answer, I think, will depend on who the client is. And I know that's a bit of a cop-out, but I think it's it's important 
to consider because you know at TD we tend to look at the the how personality affects and shapes how we see our wealth and and whether that's risk or other elements of wealth management and so when we can tailor that message to a personality you know person that's when the conversation becomes really powerful and it and it and it it takes it to a new level of customization that i think is uh, really important in the industry yeah yeah something i always struggle with so i want to talk i want to talk about these three i wrote down two of them i got late i was late to the game i wrote down two of them while you were talking you'll have to fill in the third for me Social comparison's been the one that I've been sort of chomping, you know, chomping at the bit to mm. talk about this whole time. You know, I moved from a home where I was the the smallest home in my neighborhood, uh, excuse me, the sort of the, the cheapest home in, in my neighborhood, right? To to now one where it's like one of the more expensive homes. And it's I've noticed a, a very pronounced difference like right i've noticed sort of this the social comparison piece is really powerful if we're looking to be happy with our money if we're looking to be confident with our money what's the environment we ought to be creating for ourselves from a social comparison standpoint so you know not to be a little too cheeky here but do you tend to feel wealthier now that you've moved to the best house in the neighborhood versus where you were before? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, I think that's it. It's you're, the social compare, the people that you surround yourself with are, are really, really important. So if I was going to be a little crass and say, you should hang out with people who are less wealthy than you so that you feel better about yourself is, is, at the end of the day, well, not at the end of the day, but it's it's one perhaps crude way of of making yourself feel better. But this idea of the hedonic treadmill and you know, adapting your lifestyle with your new levels of income, it, you know, has been around for a long time. But where this starts to get, I think, it starts to erode how how wealthy we feel is when we move to new neighborhoods and that's an example I've, I've used in the past because you know the people who who live in that you know big house next door compared to the house that you used to live in you know might it, it will negatively affect you and so you know it's it's we reach a point where like i said before comparison is the thief of joy and I think it's really important to shift the, the perspective and the narrative towards where you used to be as the main driver of your feelings around wealth and not other people because of the, at, because where you go and the decisions that you make are more within your control than what other people are doing with their lives. And so the, by focusing on the progress that you've made as the source of uh, joy and happiness and, and wealth. In your life is probably a better strategy than to compare yourself to those people who you really know nothing about. So you know, we'll we'll make this a free a free therapy session for me and, and say way more than I should, you know. But I've I've often thought that one of the greatest sources of my whatever financial discontentment I have in my life is the fact that I just rub shoulders with extraordinarily wealthy people in the course of my job, right? Like, I mean, I work with and interact with, you know, a couple of centimillionaires and a couple of billionaires, like in the course of doing my work, because I work with, you know, founders of financial technology companies and like people who have been very successful. And it is such, it's, painful right i mean you feel <laughs> you feel unaccomplished when you when you you know sort of rub shoulders with someone like that but i know that on on paper you know i know sort of <clears throat> where my financial life sits along the global continuum but none of that matters when i'm sitting in the mansion 
you know, of, of someone my age that's a, a great deal wealthier than me. But you're right, it does feel a little crass to sort of say, well, let me go. Let me go get some friends who make less than me. So I'll feel, I'll feel better about myself. You know, I'm sitting here thinking too, it just seems like an invitation to service, uh, to charity work, to just, you know, mixing up and mixing yourself and finding yourself in communities where you might not otherwise find yourself, just associating with a broad swath of people and not allowing yourself to become insular. And, you know, for those of us who work in finance, it's just, you know, the average, you know, our average coworker, the average advisor we work with, they just very well compensated. And I do think it can it can lead us to get a little disconnected. I even laugh about, you know, we'll do a tech demo and it feels like the net worth of the, you know, the John Doe in the tech demo is always like, I don't know, five or ten million dollars. And that's just, you know, that's just not an amount of money that that the average person has. And so I feel like everything sort of shifted up in our industry. I think it's really interesting that you talk about how rubbing shoulders with extraordinarily wealthy individuals makes you feel less than in, in a way. I think that's probably coming from the fact that you are in their social circle. Hmm. I don't know if conceptually, if I think about a billionaire, I don't know if I compare myself to those individuals because frankly, they're so far away from me uh, in terms of wealth. And so that's not really a relevant comparison to me. So the social comparisons piece is, uh, is quite small in scope. It's not necessarily to those who are across the country from you or who are tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars wealthier than you. It really only plays a factor when you can see them and they are in your social circles. So the social comparison piece is in fact what it means like it's it's a it's social it's who you interact with on on some level who is in your 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 social network it doesn't mean people who are outside of it and i think that's probably why we tend on some level why we tend not to compare ourselves to you know the three and a half billion people who are on the other side of the world let's say that don't have nearly as much as we do today. Yeah. So in in the same way that you wouldn't compare yourself to someone in a developing country, you know, who doesn't have much, maybe you shouldn't compare yourself to to Jeff Bezos and and feel bad about your life, right? Correct. Yeah. So the the outlook sentiment piece that it's it's almost like the trajectory piece. What, what can be done sort of volitionally to cultivate that and to bring about greater wealth competence? If, you know, if the belief that like, hey, I may not be wealthy today, but I'm on a good path, how can we take that understanding and, and use it to our advantage? I think this comes down quite nicely on the value of a financial plan and setting a, setting a course and a path forward that the client is aware of. And so they can see how they're progressing and tracking towards that future goal. I think that knowing that they are on a path that's been made for them to, uh, let's say, a high degree of uh, customized, that's highly customized to them, is going to make them feel better about and feel more comfortable in knowing that the plan that this advisor has set them on is the right one for them. And so we see things around contingency planning and scenario analysis where we can set up events where the market dips by 20% and we can see how that is going to affect a long-term goal and whether that's still achievable. And oftentimes, if there is such a black swan event and the client can still achieve that goal, they're much more likely to stay invested and understand that the consequences of making a quick reaction today is going to do more harm than good in the long run. Yeah. You know, I think about some of the times in my life when I had the least, but didn't feel, um, you know, didn't feel poor, I guess, you know, times like in college, right. I didn't have any money, 
But if you would ask me, like, do you feel, you know, do you feel wealthy? Do you feel okay? I would have said yes, because I think you're you're on a path, right? You're on a path to something. You're you're moving in that direction. I think that's a, a powerful piece to think about. Anything else for those looking to to increase their wealth confidence? Any other sort of practical takeaways from from your research that you'd suggest? Yeah, so there's a few. What we see is that lowering personal debt massively contributes to feeling wealthier. Things like a mortgage or using debt to invest, you know, has some degree, some effect on how wealthy we feel, but it's a, you know, tends to be a very complex relationship between those debt levels and our wealth confidence. But what it's pretty plain to see that reducing how much uh, personal debt we have, so like consumer debt, credit card debt, that kind of thing really does positively influence how wealthy we feel. Second thing that we can do is to give to charity. You know, you, you mentioned that briefly before, but it's such a, you know, as my professor at the honesty would put it, giving to charity is one of the most selfish things you can do. <laughs> um, and so it, by even just having the goal to give to charity or to develop a philanthropic plan can do just as much good as giving to charity in our study. And so it's, it's really important to start to think about how we can incorporate that aspect of wealth management into a financial plan that will make us feel, make individuals feel wealthier. And the last thing, uh, people can do is to, is to hire a financial advisor. Uh, it's pretty clear from our study that having an advisor has a positive influence on how wealthy we feel. And you know, not only that, there are knock on benefits to the advisor as well. So you know, I'm just pulling up the, the numbers here, but when, when a client has an advisor, so not only will the client tend to feel wealthier, but it, the advisor develops a stronger bond with that client. And so what we see is that for those who have high degrees of wealth confidence, they're seven times more likely to say their advisor is worth every dollar in fees than if the person that has low wealth confidence. You know, likewise, they're four times more likely to say they're satisfied with their advisor and three times more likely to have confidence in their advisor's ability than if they had low wealth confidence. And so by prioritizing making our clients feel wealthy as well as be wealthy objectively, we're not only helping our clients get closer to their their financial goals, we're making them feel better about that. And that has knock on benefits for the advisor. So I, I love I love all three of those. I think it's especially powerful when again, when I think about my own uh, my own financial plan and my own experience, I have t- two very particular, uh, two very particular sort of stretch philanthropic goals that are very meaningful to me. And those drive me more than anything else, you know, more than, more than any of sort of my other financial goals. Uh, the, the hope, the desire to be able to reach those two things is just such a positive in my life and, and such a driver for me and such a why that kind of sees me through a hard day. And I don't know that we always plan for philanthropy or charity the way that we, you know, with the same degree of granularity that we plan for other uh, aspects of our financial life. But I love that your research talks about how powerful that can be. So sort of my last formal question about about the study, you know, another finding of the study was that above a a net worth of 3.5 million Canadian, which is, I don't know, 2.7 or something U.S., greater wealth doesn't lead to greater wealth confidence. And, you know, this finding to me just speaks to the degree to which this is all sort of psychological. Uh, What what sense do you make of greater wealth not giving us really necessarily meaningful greater wealth confidence? So that was a pretty surprising finding because we looked at investable assets uh, as, as this main driver here. And for the most part, our our findings supported the economic theory that more money is is better. Yeah. Um, you know, 
moving from zero to five hundred thousand dollars in, in investable assets really good for wealth confidence then we then you sort of plateau until you hit that next psychological inflection point around a million dollars everything's uh everything's golden and gravy up until that three and a half million dollar point and we thought a lot about this and again not to go back to the social comparisons but really this is the the main element of wealth confidence that took a nosedive when that level of assets was reached and what we see like you like you mentioned is that as wealth objective wealth starts to increase around that level subjective feelings of wealth tend to decrease Mm. and you know you you sort of set it up quite nicely around this idea of who we start to compare ourselves to you can imagine a scenario where an executive who's who's a client uh, of yours has has gained traction in their career they've maybe purchased a, a nice car maybe a, maybe a porsche in their 40s and then they move to a new neighborhood in their 50s where they're hitting top earning power and the people around around them are maybe driving very expensive cars maybe they're sending their kids to private school maybe they have private access to private jets or houses in other countries and so that individual who may not have grown up with that level of wealth has now reached a new plateau where they can see how much further money can take money can take an individual and i think there was this pretty awesome quote in succession where one of the sons talks about how having five million dollars in america is probably the worst possible you know possible thing for you because you're the richest the poorest rich person in america because you can you can see what how the other half lives so to speak and i think that's what's going on here Mm. it's it's coming back to now i see how much wealthier people can be and there could be regional differences across the country here because this is a a national like wide-ranging study but it's you know it's 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 a it's an element it's a finding that maybe behavioral economists might not find surprising but traditional economists may find surprising yeah it's so i'm gonna read I'm going to read that the the succession piece is so great, right? So cousin Greg says, I'm good anyway, because I was talking to my mom and she said, apparently uh, he'll leave me 5 million. So I'm golden baby. And then Connor says, you can't do anything with five, Greg. Five's a nightmare. (laughs) Greg, is it? Oh yeah. You can't retire. Not worth it to work. Five will drive you loco. My fine feathered friend. You're the poorest rich person in America. The weakest strong man at the circus. Right. And so five million, right, or three and a half or whatever the number is, elevates you to a new sort of stratum of of social comparison where you're looking up at, you know, people who are in, you know, just really another league. So just all of this is so all of this is so fascinating. But I think it's a call to be uh, intentional about. Uh, intentional about the environment we create for ourselves, the way we compare ourselves to other, to be thoughtful about uh, working with an advisor, to be thoughtful about our charitable efforts, and all in all, just really, really fascinating research on how wealth confidence can can impact everything from our happiness to uh, to the way that we assess our portfolios. So uh, in closing, if, if people want to read the study, if they want to find out uh, more about you and your team and your work, what's the best place for, for people to do that? Yeah, they can go to td.com slash behavioral finance. That's behavioral with the U because we live in Canada. And uh, you can learn more about the work that we do. You can read our industry reports as well as more uh, consumer and client friendly articles where we've uh, explored a vast degree of topics. Yeah. And uh, go back. Uh, your colleague, Lisa Brenneman, was on the show a while, a couple of years ago, I think, uh, talking about research y'all did into big five personality characteristics and, and wealth. So another fascinating episode. And Lisa's, uh, Lisa's wonderful. So go back and check that out. Anthony, thank you for your time. Thanks for contributing to our understanding of, of wealth and happiness and confidence. Appreciate it. My pleasure. 
Thanks for tuning in to Standard Deviations. If you can't wait till next week for more behavioral finance insights, visit www.orion.com. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion and its affiliates, subsidiaries, and employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.